Engine swaps are cool. I think we can all agree on that. Swapping a car is sort of a badge of honor. It takes a lot to get a swap done. But what all goes into a swap? And how can you go about doing one? This is a video about what you need to know to do an engine swap. I pretty frequently get questions about the swaps I've done, how I did them, how hard it was, what parts I was using. Answering these questions is always hard because there's quite a lot that goes into an engine swap. Thus, I'm making this video. This video is primarily for the crowd that's new to engine swaps, or maybe even new to working on cars. Perhaps you've seen a few swaps and thought, well, I want to do one. Or maybe you've even got some shop hours under your belt and you're considering diving into a swap. This video will hopefully give you an idea of what it takes to get a swap done. Now, what do I mean when I say engine swap? The type of engine swap I'm talking about is when you install a vastly different engine in your car than what it came with from the factory. This can be something such as installing a turbocharged version of the naturally aspirated engine you already had, installing an inline four in a car that originally had a boxer, or even installing a V8 in a car that originally had a rotary engine. Engine swapping is not a straightforward process. Each car engine combination has its own unique set of challenges that need to be solved. For this reason, I can't reasonably give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to do an engine swap. Nobody can. I can, however, give you an idea of what it takes to do an engine swap and point you in the right direction of what all you should learn before attempting one. Ideally, once you learn all the topics in this video, you'll be able to conquer all these challenges on your own. If you teach a man to swap, he'll drop an LS and everything in sight. Now, this video is going to be split into two main sections. The first section, I'm going to give you a rundown on what skills and knowledge I personally use when I'm doing my swaps. For each topic, I'll give a brief overview and then some examples of why you need to know these things. After that, you're on your own. My goal is simply to point you in the right direction. It's up to you to go out there and scoop up as much information as you possibly can. For the second section, I'll go over some of the ways I picked up this knowledge. And hopefully it'll give you an idea of what you can do to get a handle on some of these concepts and skills. Throughout the video, I'll be referencing two different swaps I did. My Honda K-Swap Subaru Impreza, or just the Subaru, and my Chevy LS swapped Mazda RX-8, or just the RX-8. Now I have some videos on each of these cars, so if you haven't seen them yet, you might want to take a gander before proceeding, though it's not necessary to do that. This video is going to be a doozy, so feel free to use the chapters below to jump around as necessary. Cool, now that we got that over with, we'll get on to the good stuff. First things first, you gotta learn how to research. Having a game plan ahead of any project greatly increases your chances of success. A major reason people get stuck on a swap halfway through is because something comes up that they didn't expect, that they weren't prepared to handle. So, what I do is think of every step I'm going to take during a swap. I literally run through it in my head and begin to research how I can address each and every scenario. Sometimes I even write down the steps to help me keep track. Researching can mean the difference between having a running car and being that guy who's had an FC RX-7 roller in his yard for the last three years. The best place to start is probably to find builds that others have done that are similar to yours. Read about what they did, what troubles they had, etc. You can usually find these on internet forums and YouTube videos or even social media sites. And if you ever feel the need to make a post or reach out to someone to ask questions, don't. At least, not so soon. Resist that urge as much as possible. Rarely have I ever needed to ask for help directly. Most of the information I've needed was out there, I just wasn't looking hard enough. And if you're new to swapping and you're trying to do something unique, then you might be biting off more than you can chew. See section two for more on that. And since your primary source of information is probably gonna be the internet, it's important to be able to distinguish good info from bad info. Even if the info is applicable to your desired build, remember to make your own assessments. Don't just blindly follow advice. Also, think about when it was written. Things change over time and new information may be available. Also, technology evolves. You also have to think about what the source's motivations are. If money is involved, maybe be a little skeptical. And if the writer is financially motivated, think about their goals. Do they align with yours? Not only that, do they have a good track record for this kind of stuff? Also, is the writer even qualified to give this advice? Do they really even know what they're talking about? Or are they just repeating something that someone else told them? How do you know you can even trust me? I'm just some dude who built some cars and posts videos sometimes. How can you be sure that I'm a reliable source? This is all subjective. My standards for information may be lower than yours. 
You may look at my cars and think, man, those cars are total junk. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's fine. <laughs> totally fine. Be sure to find multiple sources. Even if information conflicts, that's not a bad thing. Take everything into account and make your own assessments. The good news is this gets easier as you learn more. Like if somebody says, well, injectors increase horsepower, you'll instinctively know to take everything they say with a grain of salt. Finally, when you're researching, always be looking for blockers. A blocker is something that blocks you from achieving your goal. For example, if you plan to make your own engine mounts and you don't have a welder, getting access to a welder would be a blocker. Make a list of these things and factor them into your game plan. Before I LS swapped my RX-8, I heavily researched what trans I wanted to go with. And the typical thing to do with a junkyard LS swap is just to stick with the automatic it came with, but I like to drive sticks, so I looked up what all went into getting a manual for the LS. And the short answer is, it's expensive, which is why most LS swaps are automatics. So the price for the manual became a blocker for me. The good news is you only need one kidney, so I had a plan from the start. Now, imagine going into that blind and buying manual-specific parts like mounts, a clutch, a flywheel, and then discovering you couldn't even afford the damn transmission. And then your project just sits there for months as you save up the cash, or worse, you have to change directions and try to resell those manual transmission parts. So do your research, and take notes, and it pays off in the long run. Do you know how an engine actually works? Do you know what the four cycles are? And what are the three basic requirements for an engine to run? Knowing how an engine works helps for when things go wrong during the swap, which they will. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And trust me, shit will go sideways in the least expected ways. Learning how things work is paramount for success. Camshafts, timing, coil packs, compression. This is true for everything that you're going to do during a swap, though. Ideally, you've dealt with this stuff from maybe fixing cars or working on them in the past. If not, a swap might be a bit too much for you right now. And we'll talk about that in section two as well. The RX-8 wasn't firing on cylinder number eight when I first got it running. I checked the three requirements, fuel spark compression, and all were fine. Or so I thought. It turns out the seal around cylinder eight's intake port, that's the seal between the intake manifold and the intake port on the head, had folded in on itself and was letting way more air into the cylinder than it should have been, which means that cylinder was too lean to ever even ignite. And it didn't take much time to diagnose this, and it was an easy fix, all because I knew there was a very small number of things that could realistically go wrong. Knowing is always the difference. You're going to need to know how an engine's cooling system actually works, since you'll likely be changing up the cooling system with the swap. What is antifreeze? Why does the cooling system need to pressurize? What role does the radiator cap play, and how does that relate to the coolant overflow bottle? What do you do if it starts overheating? Now, the Subaru actually had some cooling issues when I first got it running. Using my knowledge of cooling systems and a leak tester, I was able to determine that my system was set up and sealed just fine. But I had a huge air pocket in the system and needed to bleed it properly. Now, I'll leave it as homework for you to figure out why an air pocket in the cooling system would cause overheating issues. You're going to need to know what trans you're going to go with, and what that choice entails. The two most common options are the trans that came with the car, or the trans that mates to the engine. Now, if you're planning to use the trans that came with the car, or one that doesn't normally fit to your engine's bell housing, you're going to need an adapter plate to mate the two together. And when I swapped my Subaru, I wanted to keep the car all-wheel drive, so I opted to go with an adapter plate. The kit I chose came with both the adapter plate and a special flywheel that could mount the Subaru clutch to the Honda engine, thus making it compatible with the transmission. Now each adapter plate kit is different. Some don't include a custom flywheel and instead use a machined hub that bolts a different flywheel to the engine's crank, sort of in the same way a wheel spacer works. And there's other types out there too, so again, do your research. Now on the other hand, if you're trying to use the trans meant for the engine that you're swapping into the car, you've got a different set of problems to solve. That trans doesn't belong in that car, so you've got to get crafty. If you're doing a rear-wheel drive swap, you'll need mounts for that trans and a custom drive shaft, and perhaps some other little bits too. Now thankfully, drive shafts are pretty easy to source. I got the one for the RX-8 fabricated at a local diesel mechanics shop. And with the RX-8, which uses the manual trans the LS came with, the shifter sat a bit too far forward. So I had to cut the shifter hole open a bit and use a shifter relocation kit to bring the actual stick back. If I didn't do that, I'd end up punching the radio every time I tried to go into gear. I also made some custom trim to seal things off from the outside world. Now if you're doing a front-wheel drive swap, or like a transaxle type swap, 
you're going to need to get some custom CV shafts made, and relocate the shifter somehow. The same principles apply though, you got to get the power to the wheels, and you've got to mount the thing. And since we're on the topic of transmissions, if you're going to go with a manual trans, it's important you know how a clutch actually works. How do you bleed a hydraulic clutch? How do a master and slave cylinder work together, and how do you adapt the car's clutch pedal to work with that system? Now you're going to want these things under your belt so you can tackle any issues that pop up. Both the Subaru and the RX-8 are manuals. And normally you'd think that the Subaru would be tougher to work with since it uses an adapter plate, but the RX-8 actually gave me more trouble, despite using the trans the engine was meant to use. And it turns out the previous owners broke the clutch pedal bracket, so when I pushed the clutch, the whole assembly would flex, and the clutch wouldn't fully disengage. And since I know how clutches actually work, I was able to narrow it down to this, but it did take me a while because who the fuck would JB weld a broken clutch assembly back together? The previous owners, I guess. That's who. When doing a swap, you're gonna need to get your brakes to work. Now most cars nowadays use engine vacuum to provide braking assist via a brake booster. And you may also have to do brake line work to clear the specific engine in the engine bay. So, make sure you know how a brake booster works with relation to engine vacuum, and you should probably also know how to bleed brakes, and what to do if you're having issues with your braking system. The RX-8 is a good example for this. The ABS pump was too tight against the head of the LS, so I ended up having to delete it. Thus, I had to bleed all the lines. And after doing all that, I had to plumb up the brake booster to the intake manifold so I'd have proper braking power again. Amounts are usually where most swaps begin, and where most swaps end. Mounting the engine and the trans is the easiest part of a swap, especially if you buy a mounting kit. Remember, anyone can turn a wrench. Don't jump into this thinking you can do a swap just because you can get things to mount, because there's much more to it than that. Go look for swapped cars online. You'll probably see that most of the cars have just the engine and trans mounted, and the previous owner lost interest or got bored. Now that may be the case, but I can imagine a world where someone mounts the powertrain and then is confronted with all the hard stuff or the cost of it all and then just bails on the project. So make sure you're aware of what you're getting into before proceeding. You've typically got two ways to go for mounts. A, you buy a pre-made mounting kit for your swap, if it's a common swap, or B, you make your own mounts. A pre-made mounting kits are of course easier and faster to make on your own, but that comes at a cost. Money. The cost is money. I bought a mounting kit for the RX-8, and while it was a little pricey, it was well worth it because it made the swap much faster and the mounts were, frankly, better than anything I can do with my current skills or tools. The Subaru, on the other hand, I had to make my own mounts. There's no mounting kits you can buy for a Honda K Subaru swap because it's so rare. That being said, I'm no pro when it comes to fabrication, but I was still able to booger up my own mounts just fine. I just used some square tube and plate steel I had laying around from past projects. The main tools I used were a welder, a grinder, and a drill press. Also remember that if you're swapping transmissions, like I did for the RX-8, you're going to need mounts for that as well. You'll probably want to know how to fab up an exhaust for your custom build. This one isn't too hard, I'll be honest. Slapping together a functional exhaust isn't all that difficult and can be done on a budget. What is hard is making an exhaust that will increase performance. But if you're newer to this, I'd suggest you just focus on making sure you don't suffocate in the cabin first. Start small, get things working, and then focus on performance if you feel the need. Both the Subaru and the RX-8 have exhausts that I boogered together out of cheap tubing and spare parts. The Subaru was actually pretty easy. I only really had to make a downpipe to go from the turbo to a WRX catback exhaust. I ordered a cheap exhaust tubing kit that came with some 45 degree bends and some straight pipes, mocked it up under the car, and then hot glued it together with the MIG welder. The RX-8 was more complicated. Most aftermarket RX-8 catbacks are only 2.5 inch, and each header coming off the LS had a 3 inch outlet. I didn't want to constrain flow, and I already had a bunch of 3 inch tubing left over from the Subaru swap, so I decided to fab everything using 3 inch tubing and spare parts. This was a bit more time consuming, however, the same rules applied. I'd mock things up under the car, tack them in place, and then send them home with the welder. Nothing too crazy. The only real issue I have with the setup is the Y-pipe that combines the two headers together hangs pretty low. It has to go under the transmission. So every now and then it'll grind on the ground. If you're swapping a turbocharged engine into your car, it pays to know how a turbocharger system actually works. And not just the turbo itself, that part is easy. But how does a wastegate work? How does a boost controller work, manual or electric? And why do we need a blow-off valve? What role does the intercooler play? How does the oiling system work? 
Keeping all that stuff intact usually requires some knowledge on the topic. And if you're planning on turboing a naturally aspirated engine at the same time as swapping, keep in mind that adding a turbo adds complexity, which means there's more things to go wrong. A swap is already very complicated, so don't set yourself up for failure. The Subaru's K24A2 is a naturally aspirated engine that I turboed while I did the swap. I was able to confidently do this because I had past experience with working on other turbocharged cars. Now, had I not had prior experience, I probably would have just swapped it in there naturally aspirated and left the turbo stuff for later. And there's nothing wrong with that. When doing a swap, you're going to have to hook your engine up to some sort of fuel source, so knowing how a fuel system works is necessary. Now, how does your fuel pump assembly work? What's the difference between a return and returnless system? How does the fuel pressure regulator fit into all this? And how much fuel pressure should you even be running? Even more than that, if you're gonna try to go for more power, you'll probably wanna know how to size your system appropriately. The more power you want, the more fuel you gotta deliver to the cylinders. Now, both my swap utilized the stock fuel systems right up to the fuel rail. The Subaru came with a return style system that I ended up adding a bigger pump to so it would support not only the power I want, but also E85, because me likes the corn juice. And since this was a custom build, I opted to use an aftermarket fuel pressure regulator. The RX-8, on the other hand, has a returnless system. Again, I plumbed this right up to the fuel rails, but in the RX-8's case, I didn't change anything about the fuel system. Didn't even upgrade the pump. It's still the stock one that fed the rotary. Both cars, however, are fitted with fuel pressure sensors that are wired to their standalone ECUs. If the fuel pressure drops below expected levels, the ECU cuts the electronic throttle and saves my behind from a potential lean condition. But, more importantly, I can data log the fuel pressure levels. And when I said that my big ol' 6 liter V8 is being run by a pump that was designed to run a 1.3 liter rotary, you might have had some doubts about that. Here's the thing. Not only does it work, I have certifiable proof that things are okay in the form of a data log straight from my ECU. And here's the best part. I knew the factory pump would work before ever building the RX-8 because I understand the relationship between fuel and horsepower. So I could make a guess that the car would run and drive and probably even support wide open throttle pulls. I'll leave it to you to learn more about all that. And this is more than likely where people get hung up the most. Even if you get everything else done in a swap, you still need to wire it up to get it running. Now, I'm not going to say that you need to know what every little wire going into an ECU does. And sure, that would make things easier and much cheaper, but you can get away with not knowing all that. If you have the aptitude, though, you should learn how to wire an engine from scratch. More on that in section two. If you don't know how to wire an engine, you've still got some options. If you're going to run a commonly swapped engine, you can get what's called a standalone harness not to be confused with a standalone ECU. That's something completely different and we'll talk about that next. What these standalone harnesses let you do is run the engine completely independent of the car using either a factory ECU or a standalone ECU, depending on what you wanna go with. You just have to give them 12 volts, wire up the starter, and the thing should just run. You could literally run the engine right on the ground if you wanted to. One downside is that you might have trouble getting other things to work right in the car. Radiator fans, alternators, dash clusters, people tend to struggle with these things when working with standalone harnesses. And this is why you might find that people wire radiator fans or fuel pumps to a switch instead of them coming on automatically. Wiring can be hard. But the standalone harness gets you past the most complicated part of the wiring harness, like the sensors, the ignition coils, the injectors and all that. Now, if you're looking for a more cohesive experience where things work like it came from the factory, or maybe there's no standalone harnesses available for your setup, you might be interested in what's called a harness merge. This is where you merge the car harness, the engine harness, and the ECU harness to hopefully have things work as if the car came from the factory that way. Now, some of this comes down to the ECU too, but we'll get into that. There are some companies out there that will do harness merges for you, but not only are they usually expensive, they can sometimes take months to complete. It's up to you to decide if the results are worth the time and money. Now, the first swap I ever did was a WRX swap into a 2000 Impreza RS. This is a pretty common swap, so there are services to do the harness merge for you, but I resisted temptation and instead opted to learn how to merge harnesses myself. And I am very glad I did. So stick around for section two to know why. The ECU, or the engine control unit, sometimes called a PCM or just engine management, this is the brains of the operation. It's what's injecting fuel and sparking the spark plugs and actually making the engine run. 
Now there are two common paths to go down nowadays, the factory ECU or the standalone ECU. Using a factory ECU for your specific engine is the cheapest way to go, so long as your factory ECU can be tuned. Now, what do I mean by that? Tuning an ECU, or sometimes called flash tuning or reprogramming, is where you're able to download the code that runs the ECU from its memory, make modifications to that code, usually referred to as tuning, and then flash that modified code back to the ECU's memory, thus altering how the ECU runs the engine. Tuning is necessary for most swaps. For example, if you're swapping an LS into a car and want to use the factory ECU, you need to, at a minimum, disable the immobilizer, or the ECU security. When a factory ECU doesn't detect the rest of the electronics that it originally talked to in the car it came from, it refuses to run the engine because it thinks it's been stolen. Even if you pull an ECU from one car and put it into another, it knows it's in a different car and needs to be reprogrammed before it will run the engine. Not all ECUs are like this, however. Older Subaru ECUs were much more forgiving and could be made to operate on their own pretty easily. Now, each make and model of car usually have specific tools and programs to flash tune them. For example, LS-powered cars might use HP tuners, or EFI Live, while the Subaru guys may choose open source, or Cobb access port. There is no one-size-fits-all deal. And remember, this is about the car the ECU came out of. So even if I'm swapping an LS into a Subaru, I'd still use the LS tuning programs. A standalone ECUs are a different story altogether. A most standalone ECUs support a wide array of engines, and they're specifically designed to operate independently. Some even support integrating with a specific chassis electrical system so things like dash clusters can work. Standalone ECUs typically have more features than a factory ECU can provide. For example, your factory ECU flash tune might be able to get you things like launch control or no lift shifting, but the standalone will have all those features, and plus many more like E85 support, rolling anti-lag, turbo timers, engine protection features, the list goes on. The downside is that standalone ECUs are usually pretty pricey and can be more complicated to get things up and running. Also, while most standalone ECUs support a ton of engines, make sure whatever one you choose supports your specific engine before buying. Now, I've personally ran cars with both factory and standalone ECUs, though when I'm doing swaps, I tend to run a standalone. Now, the RX-8 standalone is wired and programmed in a way that both my dash cluster and my electric power steering remain functional. Now, doing this with a factory ECU requires some hacky business where the Mazda ECU runs in parallel with the LS ECU. It's just a mess. And plus, I like the features the standalones give me, so the choice ain't hard. Now, something to think about is how you're going to get the throttle body to actuate. Your two choices are cable throttle, also known as drive-by cable, or electronic throttle, also known as drive-by wire. Now, cable throttles are more simple to work with. In some cases, you can adapt the factory throttle pedal to work with your engine's throttle body. If not, it's also possible to swap the entire engine-specific throttle pedal over to your chassis. Now, things can get finicky, but it's totally possible with just a bit of fabrication. Electronic throttle bodies may seem more complex, however, they really just come down to some wiring. The catch is, your ECU has to support electronic throttle. In my opinion, electronic throttle bodies are easier to work with than cable throttle bodies. Plus, then you don't have to worry about idle valves because the ECU controls idle using the electronic throttle body. I did a WRX turbo swap on a 95 Impreza for a buddy of mine. The original cable throttle didn't fit properly, so I made a custom bracket to mount the throttle cable so the throttle would open properly. It wasn't too difficult to do, I just drilled some holes in aluminum bar stock and bent it. It was just fiddly. With both the RX-8 and the Subaru, I chose to go with electronic throttle bodies. The RX-8 was already equipped with an electronic throttle body from the factory, so I just wired the existing pedal to the standalone ECU, and then wired the throttle body to the ECU, and presto, I had throttle control. The Subaru, however, came with a cable throttle body. I still wanted to use an electronic throttle body, so I ended up having to get an electronic throttle pedal, make a bracket to mount it to the car, and then wire it to the ECU. Again, that was just drilling some holes in a metal plate and bolting it to the car. Easier than working with a cable, in my opinion. In some cases, when you do a swap, you may have to modify the original steering system in some way or another. Knowing how a steering rack works, and how things connect to the steering column and wheel, and how power steering works will help you out here. Both the Subaru and the RX-8 needed their steering racks relocated down lower to accommodate the new engine setup. 
Thus, both needed extensions of some sort for the steering column to reach the now lower steering rack. Changing the steering geometry can have negative impacts to how the car handles, so you're going to need to know about that too if something like this comes up. All right, that about wraps it up for the first section. Remember, the purpose of all of this is to give you an idea on what you need to know to do an engine swap. If you know everything on this list, that's great. You can probably start a swap on a car. If not, you now have a handy list of things you can go and learn about. Now, I'm sure I forgot some stuff on this list, but this should be more than enough to get you started. Okay, I think that's all I got. And this is by no means a comprehensive list of what you need to know to do an engine swap, but hopefully it's enough to get you on the right path. Remember, the journey to engine swaps is a marathon, not a sprint. Having all the requisite knowledge is the key difference between finishing a swap and selling it to me on Craigslist. All this knowledge may seem overwhelming, like you'll never be able to learn all this. But I can tell you from experience that as you start learning each of these topics, the others get much easier. Each new thing you learn relates to the rest of your knowledge, so things just kind of start naturally coming to you faster. There have been countless times that I'd just be laying under my car thinking to myself, I am in over my head. There's no way I can finish this. I just ruined this car. But after taking a break and sleeping it off, maybe doing some research, I was able to figure it out. I remember having that feeling during my first manual swap. And looking back now, it, it seems almost crazy. Like a manual swap is one of the easiest things compared to what I do now. But at that time, I could have never imagined myself doing something like an LS swap. The best piece of advice I can share is to start small. If you've never pulled an engine or swapped a trans or done a bit of wiring, this might be a bit much for you right now. Instead of diving right into a crazy swap, get something simpler. Go get a Honda and swap a manual into it. Figure out how to tune and slap an eBay turbo kit on there. Just doing all that will teach you a ton and in the end you've got yourself a super cool car that you built yourself and it probably didn't even break the bank. Then, once you're more comfortable with these topics, start getting a little more adventurous. But there's no need to rush. Well, you made it to the end. So tell me, did I change your mind? Did I convince you that you're able to do a swap? Or did I maybe cause you to rethink and hold off on one for a bit? Let me know in the comments. I plan to make some more videos like this one, more instructional in nature. If you're into that kind of thing, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to like the video. It helps push this to the top of search results so more people can hopefully gain access to this information. And hey, thanks for sticking around. Bye for now. Uh, by the way, the green screen I'm using is actually just some St. Patrick's Day table covers that I got from the dollar store. A buck each. Can't beat that.